today's episode of Plants of the Gods, we explore the world of chocolate with guest Denise Castronovo, founder of Castronovo Chocolates. Denise shares her journey from tasting fine Swiss chocolates as a child to sourcing cacao from the Northwest Amazon, working with local communities to ensure ethical practices. She explains the rich flavor profiles of artisanal chocolate and its 600 plus flavor notes. Join us as we delve into chocolate's ancient origins, modern production, and the importance of sustainability in the industry. Welcome, everyone. Welcome back to Plants of the Gods. I'm Mark Plotkin, Dr. Mark Plotkin of the Amazon Conservation Team. I'm an ethnobotanist who's been working in the Amazon on the plants and peoples of the Amazon for almost four decades. And one of the most important plants of the Amazon that people don't realize comes from the Amazon is chocolate, the Abroma cacao. It may seem a bit odd that in a podcast devoted primarily to hallucinogenic plants, we're talking about an edible plant. But one of the many reasons we've chosen to focus on chocolate and cacao is that Linnaeus, the father of scientific classification, named the genus of cacao theobroma, the food of the gods. So if we're doing plants of the gods, we certainly need to do the foods of the gods. And we have a very special guest today, Denise Castronovo, who I'm honored to call a friend, also happens to be my favorite chocolate maker in the world, also is a board member of the Amazon Conservation Team. So that's three great reasons we're here to listen to Denise, so welcome, Denise. Thank you, Mark, for having me today. I'm delighted to be here. Well, you know, when Linnaeus described coffee, he called it cafea arabica, because everybody thought it came from Arabia, which is where most of the coffee was marketed at the time. And many people associate cacao and chocolate with Mexico and Central America because Western civilization first came into contact with cacao and with chocolate products uh, when the conquistadors met the Aztecs and in some cases with the Mayas. But cacao originates in the Northwest Amazon. And one of the things that, uh, that makes Castronovo chocolate so special is not only does much of the chocolate come from the Amazon, but you, Denise, go there to work with the people, indigenous people, Afro-Amazonians, to see firsthand that you're getting the best stuff and that people are treated fairly. The history of cacao is not unlike the history of many tropical products, which is very sad and very abusive in terms of the people that do the actual work in terms of cultivation and picking. But talk to us about how you got started with Castronovo chocolates and what makes you so different and so much better than so many of your competitors. Certainly. Um, For me, chocolate has really been a culmination of many of my life's experiences. When I was six years old, my aunt married a Swiss gentleman And when they would come visit us in the United States, they went and lived in Switzerland, they brought over these delicious Lindt Sprugli chocolates that were not available in the United States in the 80s. And they were just, we were amazed by them. We were amazed that there is just this higher level of chocolate out there that did not exist in the United States at the time, having grown up on Hershey Kisses or Hershey or Nestle products. They were infused with liquors, not necessarily fine flavor, as we'll get on to discuss later, but they were infused with hazelnut and hazelnut centers and just really a true fine product. And so that was my first exposure to chocolate at a very young age, and I knew there was something out there that was always better. And I purposely loved dark chocolate as a young child even, It was either dark chocolate or white chocolate, and milk had no place really for me. (laughs) So then I grew up learning more about fine foods. I, I worked in a pizzeria when I was high school and was the only woman behind the line making pizza with the, with the guys. And, but I learned how to make food from scratch and really how to manage a food operation. I, I took on every job at that restaurant from hostessing to waitressing to, but really what I most liked was working behind the line. And um, in high school, I also got this appreciation for the Amazon rainforest that just came out of my own interest. And I started researching everything I could about the Amazon. And 
actually my Sunday afternoons at the pizzeria, I would question the Brazilians about the Amazon <laughs> that I worked with. And one of them actually grew up in Manaus, which is the capital of the Amazon. And he told me about the different fruits and all of the superfoods sort of that came from there that, that they grew up on. And um, I, in turn, told him about the United States history so he could work on his citizenship exam. <laughs> so um, the relationship went both ways. And um, But anyway, this appreciation for the Amazon is really what led me into studying uh, environmental science. And um, I did an undergraduate degree in environmental science at Lehigh University and then also went on to do a master's in economics because I was very um, almost upset with my degree in the sense that it didn't make sense how conservation could have an economic value. And I was getting very interested in sustainable economics, which was an emerging field at the time in the early 90s. And so I studied economics and the theory behind economics and then went on to do Ph.D. work in ecology at the University of Georgia, focusing mostly on plant ecology and landscape-level ecology, uh, geographic information systems, which is mapping technology and how to map landscapes and land use changes. So that really became an interest of mine. And spent then about 15 years working in geospatial technology. And then I stumbled upon chocolate again <laughs> after um, I, I really grew an interest of um, directing my career in getting out of the field of consulting and moving into developing a product. And at the time, I started getting interested in superfoods again from the Amazon and stumbled upon cacao and how cacao can have all these different flavor notes, which was something that was completely new to me. And I knew at the time, like most people were adding flavor to chocolate, like adding lavender or chili or cinnamon or things like that. But nobody was letting the cacao speak for it itself in terms of flavor. So I saw this as an opportunity, and uh, on the side, I started making chocolate at home, and the equipment was available to do that, to make chocolate at home, and then I quickly realized that this is an opportunity in Florida to do this because the bean-to-bar movement was really just getting started in Florida, and it was an opportunity to really uh, introduce this kind of chocolate to Florida. Well, we live in a world where Hershey says they make about 60,000 Hershey Kisses every minute of the day, where billions of M&Ms are produced around the world. But it would sound like, seems like that these bigger corporations will just get bigger and more powerful. There's enormous amounts of consolidation in the chocolate industry. But we see the birth and the growth of, of companies like yours, artisanal chocolate. People want the real thing. So talk to us, if you will, about why people want the real thing and what distinguishes the artisanal chocolate versus much of the mass-produced stuff that is so much more common. Yeah, thank you for asking that. The main thing is many different industries have gone through this artisanal rebirth, actually, like you saw it with beer, the craft beer industry, coffee, and really chocolate now is still in its emerging, um, it's still growing in this area. So it, it's a lot of educating the public that there is this fine flavor specialty cacao out there, and chocolate can have over 600 different flavor notes which wines, I believe, have about 300 or mm -hmm. something like that. And a lot of this flavor comes from the different varietals of cacao, the terroir where they're grown, and then also how we manipulate the chocolate as chocolate makers to bring out those flavors in terms of roasting and processing the chocolate. So it's really a different mindset of always making a uniform product that tastes the same to making one that can change based on the harvest of the cacao, based on 
um, where we get the beans, whether it was a dry season or a rainy season that particular year for that particular harvest. And it's really turning chocolate into a gourmet food that it's never been before. Well, wine drinkers make a big deal of how they drink wine, smelling it, looking at the color, stuff like that. But when I watch you eat a piece of chocolate, it's a lot different than when I see somebody grab a cheap bar at 7-Eleven. So tell us the way to really appreciate a good bar of chocolate in terms of the snap and the color and things like that, which should be looking at and smelling and sniffing and hearing and all the other senses that should come into play. Yeah, sure. So when you first taste a piece of fine chocolate, what you want to do is break off a piece, and it should have a nice snap, but also not be too brittle or dry. And um, then you want to rub the piece of chocolate between your fingers and really take a smell of it. So when you take a smell of it, what happens is your nose can actually sense thousands of different odors. But taste, you have five taste sensations. So it opens up the palate and helps like train the palate of this is what's coming. <laughs> so then you um, take that piece of chocolate and you put it in your mouth. You can take maybe one bite, but you really want to let it melt in your mouth. And the fine European chocolates or even the way we make them in America, should have like a really nice smooth melt feel. And that's just like gorgeous when the cocoa butter just starts melting in your mouth and covering the palate. And um, fine chocolate, like a wine, has flavors that come out in the beginning, middle, and finish. So sometimes you'll get like some fruity flavors up front that you'll notice like start converting to maybe something more nutty at the end. And it's beautiful. Like very complex chocolates will have this experience that goes on as you eat them. So really our best consumers of this type of chocolate we call our nibblers. Like you just savor one little square at a time. And and then those flavors like last in your mouth sometimes 20 minutes after, even from one little square. So it's not really something that you're chewing down and eating quickly because your body is just saying, give me more sugar. Mm -hmm. It's it's an experience. It's It's wonderful. Well, I had a not dissimilar experience with chocolate growing up as a child of the 60s. I thought Hershey's chocolate was the be-all and end-all. And then when I was about 10, my grandmother gave me a piece of semi-sweet chocolate. And then I knew I was in heaven because I thought it couldn't get better than this. Well, now we go into a store and we see that there's bacon chocolate, there's potato chip chocolate, there's lavender chocolate. So where do you see this all going? I mean, do you just see more and more admixtures and stuff along? I mean, it seems on the one hand, people want the pure stuff. On the other hand, people want to try all kind of wild uh, uh, add-ons. So, as a chocolate maker, how do you how do you see this? Yeah, um, I think certainly what I like to keep educating people about is the origin cacao mm -hmm. and the flavors that can come from the different regions of the Amazon, and in particular. The one place that really sparks my interest is Peru. A lot of the um, cacao originated in the upper Amazonian basin, and Peru has about 13 different states that all grow cacao, and every region has its unique flavor profiles. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and they're actually naturally sweet. So I think that the Peruvian cacao is just wonderful. And um, in terms of flavor infusions, I feel like that is just a lot of creativity. And um, sometimes it's a way to help market your chocolate because um, the consumer is already accustomed to all chocolate tasting the same except for whatever I add to it. So if I add hazelnut or if I add chili or cinnamon, 
um, that gives me something different, like that I haven't tried before. So um, it's nice to have a few bars like that as entry level for people. Like, oh, you like coffee and chocolate? You should try this bar. Mm -hmm. But then you can say, but this cacao over here has coffee flavor notes that actually come from the cacao. Like mm -hmm. nothing is added. Right. So it um, it basically helps educate the consumer, like kind of brings people in with these marketing bars almost of marketing by adding flavor infusions. And then you can really spark people's interest like, oh, but this one here has orange flavor and that comes from the cacao itself. We didn't add orange to that. Well, as an ethnobotanist focusing on South America, I've read a lot of books on chocolate, and there's this repeated trope that, uh, you know, the Aztecs and the Mayas, they were kind of ignorant savages. They just had this really bitter drink, and the Spaniards didn't like it. But having had the honor and privilege of working with a lot of indigenous peoples in Central and South America over the years, they're obsessed with sweets. And honey is like a, a, a beloved commodity. So the idea that these guys wouldn't be mixing in stuff to make it sweeter when they're living in rainforests full of honey strikes me as almost condescending. And the fact that, as you point out, there are these different varieties that kind of taste like they have coffee in them, kind of taste like they have sugar in them, uh, says that we just have historically looked down at people who ended up knowing a lot more than we did. But I think one of the things that comes to the fore in what you're saying is the value of biological diversity. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk a lot about species conservation, but we don't talk as much about varietal conservation or terroir conservation. And so when people say to me, well, you know, save the rainforest, that's so 1970s. Well, nobody stopped eating chocolate since the 1970s, even if Save the Rainforest isn't quite the call to the ramparts that it was. But I do think that we need uh, species like chocolate. You know, the way to somebody's heart in many cases is through their stomach. Uh, and these new superfoods, acai, which is now commonplace, but back when you and I started traveling in South America, it was pretty much a local thing. And I remember people telling me it, it really doesn't have any commercial potential. It's kind of an acquired taste. And now you have kupuasu, first cousin of chocolate, which you're making a kupuasu bar and seems to be ever more common. So talk to us a little bit about kupuasu. Okay, sure. Um, so kupuasu is a different theobroma. It's theobroma grandiflorum. And typically the pulp is consumed in Brazil in particular. A lot of Brazilians drink the pulp of kupuasu in um, add a little bit of sweetener to the pulp, but it makes a very um, nutritious drink, like a smoothie. Mm -hmm. You can blend it in the blender. And kopoazu is a little different from cacao um, in that there is a substantial amount of pulp around every single seed, mm -hmm. so much so that you could cut off the pulp around the seed and save that for beverages and then you still have pulp around the seed that you can then use to ferment the, mm -hmm. the kopoazu seeds. Mm -hmm. So you can get two products out of it. And um, it's different as well. It's not typically grown in plantations. It's grown more in the wild in the Amazon. Mm -hmm. And the tree, as it matures, it actually drops the pod to the ground. So when the, the pod is ripe, it falls to the ground. So you don't have to have long clippers or anything mm -hmm. to get up into the tree canopy to collect it. Mm -hmm. And um, until recently, not a lot of people are using the seed to make like a chocolate-like product. Um, there's been growing interest now in the craft chocolate movement, particularly um, chocolate makers from Peru and um, myself included, that are starting to use the seed to make a chocolate-like product. And uh, for Kupuazu, you would still ferment the seed, and a lot of these um, beautiful flavors from the pulp get incorporated into the seed, so you can get some floral and some fruity and also some very nutty characteristics. And it makes a chocolate bar that almost tastes like it has milk in it, yet there's no milk added. It has this 
beautiful creaminess to it. I think part of human nature is wanting to taste something new and delicious. You know, we've all had pina coladas, but there's a lot more tropical fruits uh, that are showing up in this craft cocktail movement. And uh, I think uh, the Northwest Amazon, in particular, Peru to Colombia, you have the greatest concentration of underappreciated flavors in terms of fruits. Uh, Nigel Smith, an old friend of mine, I think, calculated there's several hundred edible fruits in the Western Amazon, um, which are just, you know, waiting to be made into candy bars or shakes or ice cream. Mm. And, you know, there's a real need and a desire for that. Of course, that's dependent on protecting the forest, protecting the germplasm, creating the market, uh, creating the products. I mean, that's what you're doing so well. But uh, I, I don't see any end in sight. It's not like we're running out of wonderful, delicious stuff to make these new uh, food products with. Kupwasu is just one of many examples. Acai is a big success story. And we've been doing this with chocolate now for 500 years, and we're still coming up with new things to make with chocolate. So why not? I'd, l I'd like you to talk a little bit about the savory aspects of chocolate, mole being the classic. Uh, you know, Mexican mole sauce, when people taste it, they love it, and then you tell them there's chocolate in it, which you never do beforehand because they might not want to eat it. Uh, chocolate is showing up in as a barbecue rub, uh, as is coffee. So, you know, uh, I think far too many people dismiss chocolate as just another candy. But I've yeah. heard you describe... Uh, the difference between chocolate and candy. So, Sure. Um, there's always a bit of education with our consumer that um, expects that all chocolate is candy. And I like to beg to differ in that candy, the predominant ingredient is sugar. And sometimes well over 50% of it is sugar. And Chocolate does not have to be that way, and particularly fine-flavored chocolate. We just add a little bit of sugar, enough to help mm -hmm. convert some of those fruity flavor notes that may taste a little more bitter, but when you add the right amount of sugar to it, it turns into a flavor that we recognize, like mm -hmm. a fruity flavor that we recognize. So. Um, something that might taste, you know, a little more bitter, and then you add a little sugar, you're like, oh, I get orange, citrus, mandarin. So mm -hmm. every time we start working with a new cacao bean, it's realizing that proper amount of sugar that really enhances the flavor. And some cacaos, um, like a, the more criollo variety you have in your cacao that you're using, it is nutty and it is not bitty, bitter at all. Like you can eat 100% pure Criollo and think that it has some sweetness to it. So it's fascinating. And um, there's definitely a bit of educating the consumer that not all chocolate is candy. Like this is become elevated to a fine food. Well, drawing the lens back a bit, I, I think it's all, uh, it, it, it's basically we should be knowing what we're putting in our body. And it's quite striking to me when I read the labels and find out how much of chocolate has weird oils in it. You know, the most uh, popular Mexican hot chocolate, which everybody loves because it's dark chocolate and cinnamon, uh, has some palm oils in there that I don't think many people know that they're ingesting. So understanding what's going into what you're eating, whether it's a high-end or a low-end chocolate bar, it's kind of like when you go to Starbucks and you stand in line by and somebody orders something with seven ingredients and think they're having their morning coffee. It's a, it's a milkshake. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> the amount of sugar dwarfs the amount of caffeine and, and all the whipped cream and all the other stuff pumped into it. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, but do you know you're having a milkshake for breakfast and pretending it's your morning coffee? Obviously, either they don't know or they don't want to know. Yeah. But since you brought up Criollo, you know, there's more varieties of cacao being recognized all the time. But the classic three are Forestero, Criollo, and Trinitario. So can you distinguish uh, those between those three for us beginners in terms of what you, how you see them as a chocolate maker? Sure. Um, so 
certainly the criollo are the prized beans. These are the beans that um, somehow made their way from the northwest Amazon to Central America. Mm. And predominantly the Central American cacao that the Maya, the Olmec, the Aztec drank um, was criollo. And it has very low bitterness and nutty flavor. And But the problem is there was a lack of genetic diversity that made it to Central America. So a lot of the criollo has since become vulnerable to fungal diseases. And there's one called Monelia that um, has affected criollo crop and actually wiped out whole areas of it. So um, that's when these other varietals started coming about, like the, in um, in on the island of Trinidad, they crossed a Forestero bean, which um, Forestero isn't really a variety. It's more this amelinado mm -hmm. variety that comes from the Amazon area, um, more like lower Amazon yeah. towards Brazil, mm -hmm. and um, that varietal is more resistant to some mm -hmm. of these fungal diseases, and it also is different in flavor. Like, it has that chocolatey flavor that mm -hmm. everyone is familiar with. Mm -hmm. So um, it has this more depth to it that the Criollos don't. The Criollos are very mild. Mm -hmm. So when they're crossed together, it actually makes very interesting beans. The Trinitario are also considered excellent fine flavor beans and they're more resistant to some of these fungal diseases. Mm -hmm. So um, what's happened since is there's a lot of different clones that are made that cross um, different Trinitario varieties and these are the varietals that often are recommended to farmers who want to get into planting cacao. They mm -hmm. they visit the Department of Agriculture in their country, and there are different recommended varieties for them to plant. And more and more now, with the development of this fine flavor chocolate industry, those Department of Agriculture's are I've seen this in Colombia promoting some of these fine flavor varietals, which is excellent. Like they're um, not necessarily um, promoting a variety that is just more productive. Mm -hmm. So we see um, with the emergence, because really the farmer, the best opportunity for them is to sell to the gourmet market. Sure. They're going to get so much more money for their crop, right. Right. their product, their recognition. Mm -hmm. So um, there's definitely incentive to start uh, cultivating more and more of these fine flavor varietals and ones that are a little bit resistant but also are prized for their flavor. Well, again, when we talk about the importance of the Amazon, we're not just talking about having access to great chocolate, but the economies of much of West Africa is dependent on chocolate as a crop. And when you have these diseases sweeping through, which they always have and always will, mm -hmm. you need that germplasm. So whether you're making the world's best chocolate in Tuscany or in Florida, uh, you have a stake in these rainforests just like these peasant farmers in West Africa. So it's all connected. I mean, this is one of the upsides and the downsides of globalization, that diseases can move around a lot more quickly. You don't have to get hide out on a sailing ship for two months. You know, you can be just about anywhere in a couple of hours. So I think that all of us who love chocolate have a responsibility to think about how do we protect the, the root source, literally? How do we protect those plantations? What's our stake in it? And when people smink, think small, like, oh, well, we're Fortress America, what happens overseas doesn't affect us, we have problems at home, we don't need any foreign aid or anything like that, realize that this is just one of many manifestations of the connections that connect us all. So in that sense, cacao and chocolate is kind of a connective tissue between us and the tropical world in terms of well-being and, you know, our favorite dessert. Yeah. 
I think that a lot of people tend to overlook that. Um, but, you know, one of the interesting aspects in, in looking at how chocolate is marketed and consumed, one of the things I find is that Oreos, interestingly enough, which are, you know, big consumer items, not artisanal in any sense, have a real chocolatey essence in the cookie part, not the cream part, which is sweet. I don't know if they're using nibs in there or what to give that real chocolate flavor. It hasn't just been homogenized to taste like a Hershey bar. No, what happens in something like an Oreo cookie or is what's called Dutch processing. So they uh, alkalinize the cacao Mm -hmm. to remove all of the acidity. So um, so you get a Dutch processed cocoa powder that you can buy at the store, and those um, are have removed a lot of the natural acidic flavors, the, the tannins of the cacao, mm-hmm. to make it taste not bitter. Mm-hmm. And so that in some respect, is what a lot of people are familiar with in terms of chocolate flavor, like when we talk about how chocolatey is it. Mm -hmm. Like they're familiar with that flavor that, you know, you get in a chocolate cake or Mm -hmm. a lot of baked goods. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So another part of the chocolate process we touched on in an earlier episode was conching or, or conking. Can you describe what that is and and why it's important? Because that's something about chocolate that most of the general public never hears or doesn't know anything about. Yeah. um, Conching started out with lint. They developed the first conch, which is a machine. It's a big, like, horizontal machine, the original one, that has these rollers that go back and forth, Um, sweeping the chocolate back and forth, and it's aerating the chocolate. There's a lot of volatile compounds that come out as chocolate is being processed or conched, and those tend to be compounds that are a little more acetic, like you're trying to evaporate some of the acetic acid that is inherent in the cacao, which comes essentially from early on in the in the fermentation process. So in the roasting, you're evaporating a little bit of the acetic acid. Um, it, and then the more you aerate this chocolate, the more you're also getting rid of some of it. So in that process, like chocolate that hasn't been processed enough um, can taste very bitter or astringent. Astringency actually hits you more in the back of the throat. Mm -hmm. Like I've had chocolates that actually like almost burn the back of your throat. And when we first put it in the grinder though, like sometimes there's a lot of that astringency. Like you can take a whiff of the chocolate in the grinder and it gets you in the back of the throat. So you can, a lot of that evaporation happens as soon as it, it starts being processed. Mm -hmm. Well, I am intrigued by the fact that chocolate, like coffee, is native to the tropics, is grown mostly in the tropics. And I I focus on tropical America, but I've traveled in Africa and I've traveled in Asia. You can get coffee anywhere. But up until recently in the tropics, I never saw chocolate bars for sale. It was hot. They would melt. But now wonderful chocolate starting to crop up in Latin America. I've had wonderful chocolate in Colombia and Venezuela. Why is that, that people are now able to make high-end chocolate in the tropics? I think a lot of it started with the bean-to-bar movement in the United States, actually. The U.S. was really a pioneer in the bean-to-bar movement, and it happened about uh, 15 years ago where... um, The equipment became available to start making chocolate on a small scale. And the equipment, it means like stone grinders, which was actually a way of making the way the Europeans made chocolate at the turn of the century. They had these big um, granite stones that would grind the chocolate. And now um, 
some Indian companies realized that the Indian stone grinder that they use to mill rice and make an Indian flatbread can be modified if you uh, fix the motor so it doesn't burn out on you. You can modify it and process chocolate or nut butters or seed butters. And so that same equipment that was used as a rice grinder, many Indian families have these in their kitchen, you can use to process chocolate. So now at a very low cost, you can buy the equipment to start making chocolate. And a lot of um, the knowledge and how to do that, I can attribute to the chocolate alchemy, alchemist, chocolate alchemy. A lot of people get their footing in studying the material that's available on his blog that's and a website. Web, oh, it's a website or a yeah, blog? Yeah, it's a, it's a website called chocolatealchemy.com. Yes. Okay. And John Nancy is the founder, and uh-huh. I think a lot of people get their footing by following this wealth of information that John Nancy published. He's mm-hmm. a uh, chemist by trade and got very interested in roasting cacao and making it at home and selling cocoa beans to people in small quantities so they can get started. So that really sparked the bean-to-bar movement in the United States. And we really became leaders in this, like then um, learning how to get cacao ourselves. Um, A lot of people start out getting their beans from John Nancy, and there now are a wealth of beans available, actually, to chocolate makers in the United States um, because we're bringing uh, containers in for the specialty chocolate market. So a lot of the bean purchases are almost pooled together, and the U.S. makers purchase from a few um, distributors who are very interested in transparency at the source of how much the farmers are being paid, uh, fair wages, um, interest in the ecology of the area, whether it's grown in agroforestry, interested in women's rights, and so it's really an all-encompassing movement. So, so with this emergence in the United States, like we really started um, inspiring the countries that we get the beans from in Peru and Colombia to start making chocolate there. Why not? I mean, you should be able to have single estate chocolate, you know, that comes from right from tree to bar, we end up calling it. Well, it's kind of a shamanic circle because these great chocolate companies, uh, Mars was started by Frank Mars, not Forrest Mars, Frank Mars. Hershey was started by Milton Hershey. Now these are two of the biggest corporations in the world. So there seems to be a move, consolidation, much of capitalism works this way. But here we're going back to visionary chocolate makers like yourself, starting small and and aimed at a niche audience and growing it up from there. So I think that all of us chocolate lovers are very happy with that development. But tell us about some of your success stories, uh, particularly in the Sierra Nevada, of working with these very isolated rural or peasant communities, how you can empower the women, how you can put money in their pockets, how you can do it based on local knowledge and local plants instead of the Western model of trying to go in there and introduce some sort of a monoculture that requires tons of pesticides, which ends up in their water supply. Yes, certainly. Um, So for about the past five years, I've been working with the Arhuacos in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, and this is a really unique environment in the whole world. The mountain itself is... um, the highest coastal mountain in the world. It it encompasses all of the Earth's biomes within an area about the size of the state of Massachusetts. (laughs) And it goes from the Caribbean Sea with coral reefs and sea turtles all the way up to glacial mountain peaks. And so all of the Earth's biomes exist uh, on a gradient from sea level to mountain top. And on this mountain, there are six indigenous tribes. Four major tribes. Four major Kogis, tribes. Kogis, Arwakos, Conquamos, and Wewas. 
And so we've cultivated a relationship with the Arwakos um, by working closely with um, Cacao de Colombia. I was one of the first U.S. chocolate makers to start using cocoa from Colombia. I found it through friends um, who went and visited Cacao de Colombia before they even started making chocolate themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, we first got cacao from an area of the Sierra Nevada where it's a little more high-altitude cacao, which had exceptional flavor notes and um, definitely a high percentage of Criollo content. And you can tell when you see like the the nibs of the beans itself, they're a little more reddish and blonde in color. Mm -hmm. So I knew when I first got a sample of beans from this area that I had found something really unique. And I knew that there's a wealth of Criollo cacao next door in Venezuela so why wouldn't there be some right next door in Colombia on the Sierra? So that was one of the first chocolates I started making was our chocolate bar called the Sierra Nevada. And we make it as a dark chocolate and a dark Highly milk chocolate. Highly recommended, speaking from experience, but go on. Yeah, it was um, actually one of the first milk chocolate bars to win the Golden Bean Award at the Academy of Chocolate in London. Uh, which is a blind tasting competition where they taste all these different chocolates. And the thing about our dark milk chocolate is the flavor notes of the cacao still come through even in a milk chocolate. They do. And so, give us your website for people that want to know more about the story. Yeah, so our website is castronovochocolate.com. So within a couple of years, though, Cacao de Colombia started building a relationship with the Arhuacos, and it, it took a long time to build this relationship. You don't just go in and say, I want to buy your cacao to indigenous <laughs> people. You really have to build a level of trust. And um, so I had the oper first opportunity to go visit the Arhuacos in 2019 through a trip organized um, with Cacao de Colombia and Uncommon Cacao, who are our partners in the United States who bring the beans to us. And it is a whole trust building exercise. Like we first had to sit and with the Mamo, who is the spiritual leader of the Arhuacos, and really introduce our company to him and explain like why we want to use their cacao. Like, what are we doing here? Why are we even interested? Are we on the same level of environmental consciousness as they are? And are we just trying to make a quick buck from using their beans? Or are we really trying to partner with them and send a message of protecting the environment and everything that they care about? Because the Arwakos themselves are a descendants of the Terona people, and they believe that their job is to take care of Mother Earth. And they see the Sierra Nevada as a microcosm for the planet. So Which it is. In order to, so they make spiritual offerings all around the Sierra to help keep the whole Earth in balance. And... Um, so after leaving there with our meeting of introducing our company to the Mamo, I really realized, like, there is so much bigger message here that we need to spread with mm -hmm. this chocolate. Like, one of cultural heritage, people understanding that um, there's so much more environmental conservation that goes into the chocolate and that we're building sustainable livelihoods for the indigenous people there. And it's really um, important to them that when people eat this cacao, they really understand that they're eating something very special from the Sierra. And um, so we try to deliver that message. And basically when I 
visited with the mama, they said that you need to come back four times for us to be friends. And so until that, we give you this job and this role to spread the message to the rest of the world that we need to protect the environment. We need to listen to the elements, they said, the wind, the water, and the cacao from our forest. And that this has to become part of our consciousness that we've become so disconnected with nature that this cacao can help build that connection. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. And um, so the the other thing to know about the Arawakos is um, they just re reclaim their territory by the sea. And there um, was some original cacao there from the Tehrona that never got destroyed when different narco-trafficking and things like this took control of the area at the base of the Sierra and pushed them higher up into the mountain. Mm -hmm. When they were able to come back through um, regaining their territory in around 1993, they found some of that cacao still growing there. So they have been propagating this very old cacao along with um, some other um, cacao hybrids that they have introduced. So they have a little bit more genetic diversity there and things. And you can find some very ancient criollo in their, um, in their farm. And it has like a beautiful pointed tip and the, the pulp just tastes gorgeous. I'll never forget the moment of tasting our chocolate bar, which is 80% chocolate. And I was wondering if it was really too rich for most people. And then we tasted it in the cacao field, and everything just made sense. <laughs> the flavors, and we tasted it with Hernan, who's in charge of the cacao there. So and you start off your book with that story when you sit down to write it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so more recently... My second visit to visit the Arwakos, this was after COVID. Um, they actually had reached out to me during COVID to um, build connections, to uh, to build balance around protecting the earth. And, um, and then I went back a second time and asked them, you know, what can we really do to become more of a partner for you? I know I'm helping you by buying your cacao that doesn't get you a lot of money like what else can we do and um they're actually getting into chocolate making themselves and doing a wonderful job of making chocolate and but they actually couldn't meet demand they were only using a machine that would enable them to make about five pounds of chocolate at a time mm -hmm. so we were able to raise funds through our customers and people purchasing chocolate on our website to um, purchase them a bigger grinder that, that now they can make up to about 20 pounds of chocolate. Well, and I hope you'll put something on your website regularly so that people that want to help with this type of project can do so. Yeah. Yeah, and there's many things like that they need that it, sometimes are just simple, like um, just tools when they open the cacao pod that's a lot of acetic acid that gets under your nail and hurts your nail. So just tools to help them get the cacao out mm -hmm. of the pod. Mm -hmm. um, we noticed they needed new pruning tools. They were all getting kind of rusty because they're by the sea. And I think so. that there's two lessons in here as we wind up in terms of helping these people help themselves and help us in the process. One is that it's based on relationships, mm -hmm. and relationships are not created in the first meeting. You can't show up on the airstrip anywhere in the world and say, I'm your friend. I'm going to help you. I've got a bunch of money. Trust me. I mean, you can do it, but in my experience, it, it doesn't usually work. Secondly is the idea if you really want to help people, it's not all about the money. In fact, a lot of money in a hurry can be ultimately destructive, ironically enough. It's patience. It's building up trust and friendship over time. It's figuring out what, is, what help is needed and not thinking that money is the answer. This is a mistake that we as Americans, we as people from the industrialized world make over and over. They don't have enough money. We have to maximize our income. I've seen this over and over, well-intentioned projects where you put some money in their pocket and then they move to the barrio, the favela, and are worse off. So it's, it's 
teaching people how to help themselves, empowering them, and helping them deal with the outside world on their own terms. Not telling them what to do that doesn't work, but saying, you know, here are the pitfalls. You know, you want to move to the city, it's your decision, but here's what you have to look out for. You want to build a road into your village, these are the bad things that can come in along with the good things you're yeah. thinking about. And as people who have a, a, a broader perspective than many of our indigenous colleagues, I like to think of our role as we're, we're, we're riding shotgun, you know. We're not telling them what to do. We're reading the map and making some suggestions, but the decision has to be theirs. But they should be informed decisions. Yeah, so the fact that they, you know, want to make chocolate and build a livelihood in making chocolate. And my next visit, I want to go and work with them on just some different recipes that don't need to be tempered like American or European chocolate, right. like something that could be a little more... Um, rustic. Rustic and not melt, because there's the Tayrona National Park nearby where there'd be there's a lot of tourism of people hiking and interested in natural foods. And mm -hmm. so what could we make that they can sell there, you know? And not melt. Yeah, so <laughs> helping them with some recipe development, mm -hmm. I see, is probably the next thing that I could do. And um, the other thing I'd like to mention is just um, when you visit the communities, you know, what is it other, even though you're a chocolate maker, what is it other than chocolate that you can bring back from the communities? Right. The Arwakos make these beautiful mochila bags, Ooh. and so Stunning. we're able to purchase some of those from them and resell them here in the United States. And it's um, that the money from the mochilas and their beaded jewelry that they make goes directly to the women mm -hmm. and the young women who are spending money to afford their books for school. And yep. so it goes directly to the schooling. So um, yeah. that's one of the things I encourage other chocolate makers is think beyond chocolate and what other things you can bring from the origin countries as well. Agreed. Well, thank you, Denise. This has been most enlightening. I think everybody will appreciate chocolate on a far deeper level, philosophical and gustatory at the same time. And let's agree to continue the conversation and have you back and talk more about some of these projects and what we can look forward to in the world of chocolate if we do it right in terms of protecting the forest, helping the people protect the plants and live a better life in a sustainable, culturally sensitive way. Yes, thank you, Mark, for having me. Our pleasure. Thank you once again. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please remember to check out other episodes from ayahuasca to magic mushrooms, from the ethnobotany of warfare to the history and prehistory of wine. Please give us a top rating and subscribe and share with like-minded folks. We appreciate your support for the protection of the knowledge and biodiversity of South America by the Amazon Conservation Team. In the next episode, join us as we continue our discussion about the ethnobotany of chocolate.